Mahindra Humanity Center Ford British Airways. Please ensure your mobile phones are placed on silent mode. If you need to have an urgent conversation, please do so outside the venue. Uh, flash photography is strictly prohibited. Please keep the aisles free, that's for your own safety and security. Uh, do not forget, we have a fantastic lineup of world music, uh, and that's the last night today at Clark Samir. Uh, there's Sonam Kalra and Sufi Gospel Project and Teneveran playing there. Uh, for more information, you can go to the travel desk. We're delighted to introduce Poetry Walas. Uh, please welcome Rukmini Nair, Margaret Mascarenis, Salman, uh, Salma, sorry, Vejan Mathur, Surendran, and Rahul Soni, presented by uh, Baskar Basha series. Thank you. for an hour of poetry readings by five wonderful poets. Is this better? Okay. So yeah, we are, we are in for a wonderful hour of readings of poetry by five great poets and me. Uh, the session's called Poetry Walas, but uh, all the writers here do more than that. Uh, C.B. Surendran, who writes in English, is a journalist, a novelist, and a poet. Salma, who writes in Tamil, is also a short story writer and novelist besides being a poet. Margaret Mascarenas, who writes in English, is also a novelist. And we have Bejan Matur uh, from Turkey. She writes in Turkish and will be reading translations in English. We have Rukmini, a poet and novelist. And uh, yeah, let's begin with Salma. Thank you. First, I want to uh, read my Tamil uh, poems, then after that, I can translate them. Swasam. எப்பொழுதும் எனது எல்லா காரியங்களும் நான் இல்லாத பொழுதே நிகழ்ந்து விடுகின்றன ஒவ்வொரு முறையும் எதையும் ஸ்பரிசித்து உணர்வதற்குள் அவை நிகழ்ந்து முடிகின்றன நான் முயன்றுதான் பார்க்கிறேன் என்றாவது எதுவாயினும் நிகழ்வதற்கு முன்பே நான் அதை தொடுவதற்கு ஆயினும் என் முயற்சிகளை தோற்கடித்து எனக்காக நிகழும் அவை நான் இல்லாமலேயே நிகழ்ந்து விடுகின்றன மலர்கள் மனிதர்களுடனான உலகம் மிகப்பெரியது என்னை விட நான் அனுமதிக்கத்தான் வேண்டுமா என் சுவாசம் நானின்றி நிகழ்வதே பிரீத்திங் எவ்ரி திங் ஹேப்பன்ஸ் ஸோ குவிக்லி பிஃபோர் ஐ கேன் ஃபீல் இட் ஐ கீப் ட்ரைங் டு ஃபீல் சம்திங் பிஃபோர் இட்ஸ் டூ லேட் இட் ஆல் ஹேப்பன்ஸ் இன் மை நேம் விதவுட் மீ பீயிங் த ஃப்ளவர் people the world is so much bigger than me should i carry on breathing if i am not really here contract my sister hisses at me in anger what my mother whispers tactfully that all failures on the conjugal bed are mine alone the first words i hear every night in the bedroom what's with you tonight these are most often the final words to a finger points to hold its water upon the air of timorous nights awaiting redemption from the from 10 million glowing stars float words of wise counsel 
unable to feed its young, the cat sobs like a child, and its wail seizes my heart. You too must have your complaints. My stand, though, has been made clear by time and history. To receive a little of your love, dreary, dreary though it might be, to fulfill my duties as the mother of your child. To have you bring sanitary towels and contraceptives from the outside world and to seek more such petty favors. To order you around a bit if I could. To affirm a little of my authority. My vagina opens knowing all that it should. My vagina opens knowing all that it should. This existence is complicated, like the life of a cat that hides in the kitchen. A thick layer of cream has formed on the tea waiting to be drunk. Its burnt smell is hounding me. In the drawing rooms full of human vessels, there is no one with whom I might strike up an acquaintance. Solitude in the bathroom creates fear stemming from revulsion over nudity. Houses erected inside cages swell their hustle and bustle solely to, to frighten me. In the gardens raised within walls, there is no shed in which, so, which to sit and rest. Nor is privacy ensured by the open spaces of the terrace upstairs. There is no seat on which to sit comfortably, dangling one's feet. If my child loaned me his crib, sleep might become possible. Past midnight. In the days after my pregnancy and childbirth, you search dissatisfied through the familiar nudity of our nights for my beauty's unblemished past. My bloated body and belly graced by stretch marks are truly repulsive. You tell me and that my body will not change, not now, not ever. My voice, long buried in a throw of silence, mutters to itself, yes, it's true. Your body is not at all like mine, with its fanfare and its flagrancy. In the years past, you might have had children by strange women in unfamiliar lands. No traces are left on you, of course. You can be proud of that. What can I do? These stretch marks are the same as my decline. Not so easy to repair or mend. This body is not paper you can cut and craft. Nature's betrayal of me has been far more terrible than yours. It was you, after all, who commenced the first phase of my downfall. The hours after midnight, when dreams grow and surge, are far more calamities than the hours before. Now it's past midnight. Leaving his quiet perch inside a mural, the tiger climbs onto my headboard and sits there staring at me. My last poem. Where is Tyre? She is a French model. Uh, she is very famous model. Uh, we know about the uh, her life. Uh, about uh, the not like uh, only her life. Uh, we can uh, universal uh, th uh, subject this one. They wait. They await their turn to have their vaginas sewn up. These little girls huddling, huddling inside their tight grip 
of their mother's hands. Accessed by a nurse's blunt instruments, the waste tissues assembling tiny flowers lay thrown on the desert rocks. The little girl's blood crunched cry trembles in the wind. Inside the vaginal cavity, curtains you tight, inaccessible to a penis. Pis and menstrual blood strain for release all over the world. They are lined up in a parrot. Awaiting use by a stranger, these brand new vaginas, safe and guaranteed. With their ruined libido and terrible pain, they are disappearing inside the pages of Swifty. These sisters of very tires. Thank you. Thank you, Salma. And now, uh, Rukmini Bayer Nair. Okay. Hi, I'm, I'm Rukmini. Can you hear me? All right. So I'm going to read you uh, maybe four or five poems. And they are quite, I'm often accused of being a very complicated and cerebral poet, but I'm going to read some uh, uh, poems which are reasonably straightforward. And I understand that a big theme in this conference has been mythology. So I'm going to select, I have selected four or five poems which try to reinterpret myths and mythology. So the first poem is called Kali, and uh, it was written quite some time ago. So um, a goddess chews on myth as other women might on palm. Bread juices stain her mouth. Bored by her own powers, immense and spectral, Kali broods. About Shiva, she is perverse. She will not plead with him, nor reveal Ganesha's birth. She will not ask him home. Shiva loves her, but absences and apsaras are natural to him. No god is hampered by his sins. Kali desires a mortal whose day begins with her, ends at nightfall in her arms, a man who will die without her, whose love is fallible but secure. She wants to be held like a warm creature, not a fable. Loneliness drives this goddess mad. She is vagrant, her limbs askew. She begs a mate, her hair unbathed. Fickle as Shiva, memory deserts her. Chandi or Durga or Parvati, which is she? Which of herself weeps here? Even Ganesh, for whom she feels only tenderness, excludes her. Even he seems impatient with her flaws. Where should such a goddess turn? Kali, mistress of the temporal world, once bliss defined in human terms. Stayed Ganesh knows this wildness must be curbed. Shiva, peripatetic, agrees. And across the wilderness, both gift Kali, a, a, a, a, a, sorry, a companion eagle, hurt by no arrow, fed on nothing. It returns each night to its eerie in her heart. That's Kali. Um, I will read uh, now a poem. If you have Kali, you should also have Shiva. This poem is, um, ri was written when um, uh, Stephen Hawking came to India. He's a famous scientist, as you know. And he asked me, what is, uh, what is this figure of the dancing Shiva? And uh, he was, uh, went to a party in Tiafar and he was whirling around. So then I wrote this poem for him. It's called The Third Eye. Shiva knows no Bhangra nor the Punjabi rap, but he's a divine dancer who never takes a nap. And if for the single trillionth of a second, Shiva ceased to dance, all the world's great cities would shiver on a knife edge of chance. 
every star in the universe would cease to burn. Neither sun nor earth would turn. Matter grows so dense, so intense the dark, that your cry would die. On a windless night in the lap of the sea, when shivers sweet, you will know eternity. Okay. Now the next poem is called Gulmohor. And it's a fast poem. Gulmohor. Oh, and again a feminist one. On a windy day like this, the rain clouds defend, descend, rough, tough male, and the gulmohor forgets she is a tree rooted to the ground. Everything else thrusts upwards, red gold kites, terriers pricking ears, alert to a drum of thunder, eagles and stiffish buds on small petulant plants. These rise to teasing bait, the short glamour of sex. Then why not the gulmohor? Why not she? Today the sky is a bowl, each ribbed gulmohor leaf an imprisoned angelfish, swimming round and round in the cold gray loosens of the hooligan monsoon. But unable to escape, play her deft wit off against a loutish rain cloud, the gulmohor loses heart sheds her vivacious spins, her wild scarlet flowers. Is this the nature of a tree to be, uh, to be uh, tied down eternally? Or can the gulmohor be free? Can she? Okay, and I'll just, um, lest you think that I only write poems on mythological themes and gulmohors, I'm going to now read you a very simple poem about the time when my computer broke down. And much of my poetry is like this. So I'll read uh, computer and then maybe one or two poems to end depending on time. So computer. So it's written with lots of gaps in between. So computer breaks down. I'm in a terrible panic. Okay, and this is long time ago. Uh, so, between us, a region of touch and silence. Lovers clinch. It takes loneliness to be so intimate with a machine. Oh, laugh, laugh, and recall your first shyster smile before you touched perfection, saw your scribble transformed, emerald on liquid crystal. Early fumbling, then the world pitched out. That is the gist of love. But one or the other always tires. I saw it coming for months. Awkward glitches. You did not turn on so easy. Went blank from time to time. A fading light. I should have known I would lose much. They diagnosed a loss of memory. You'd caught a virus, or maybe it was the climate. For ages, my words had wavered in you, then gone muddled. And now, your black back cleansed. It's worse, like being with a new man. The same routines without passion. Abort, retry, ignore. It's just no good. Computer. And finally, how, how, much, how much time? Two or one? One. Okay. So he says one. I can read a mythological poem or I'll read a simple, simpler one. I would have loved to read you Gargi, but we, may, we don't have time. So I will read you uh, a short poem called um, Making Ends Meet. This job is for the women. To turn, uh, to, uh, um, to stretch out a thin meal in a poor country, water is needed to complete the deal. Added to precious dal and rice, it makes these grow. It is the stuff her stick fingers knead into dough. These are the tricks she's learned to eke things out. But when water is scarce, a woman must do without. That purple gem madness, do you see it coruscating at her throat? It is worn by women in queues, waiting at city water pumps, 
pulling buckets from mud-filled wells, and by the woman who has nothing left for her child or herself. In her, the serpent swallows its own tail endlessly, and the lovely gold of her laugh trickles away, gray, stagnant. All said and done, a poem is water in a woman's hands. Thank you. Thank you, Rukmini. And, and now, uh, CP Surendra. Good to be here. I'm going to read you some old poems of mine. Uh, all of them were written in 2006, and I have not written a single line afterwards. So that makes no difference because nobody read them. So it's as good as new. Uh, these poems, you know, I normally work in sequences when I used to write poetry. Now, this particular sequence is on my father, who is a very masculine guy who died of Alzheimer's, and he was uh, also a writer in a regional language. So I wrote 39 poems, and I'll be reading some of those poems from that sequence. It's called Catafoc. And now one of the things you must uh, realize in this context is that I'm going to quote uh, three lines from a Upanishad called Katha Upanishad. Now in Katha Upanishad, there is one particular boy, he's 13 year old, whose father is not a very, very intelligent man, but, uh, and he wants a gift from the gods. So what happens is that he starts sacrificing cows. But Najiketas, the boy who is, wants good things to happen to his father, finds out that the cows which are being sacrificed are barren. So he says, why don't you offer me? What are you going to do with me? Why don't you offer me? And out of sheer anger, uh, he says that I'm going to give you to Yama, who is the lord of the uh, dead. The Yama is the ruler of the kingdom of the dead. So I'm going to read those three lines, and then I'm going to these poems. Catafalque. I go as a first at the head of many who have still to die. I go in the midst of many who are now dying. What will be the work of Yama, the ruler of the departed, which today he has to do unto me? Now the poem comes. Postnatal. A room secreting smells. Laundered linen breathing out camphor. Old spice, old books, soap ghosting the air with scent of pine. Blue ink gleaming thick in a vat of glass on the roll top desk. The fat green pen on its side run dry and smoking where it stopped. Lunar blips gilding the corner basin of water. The floor waxed black, verging on the brink of light. A dark pond mirroring the advance of the night. Wet whiffs of body wasting. My father on the court in white, straight as a corpse in a coffin. The hours crawl about him in ambush detonating memory cells at each intractable breath, burning synapses down like a bridge, weighting his tongue down with speech slush. Between flashes he wakes up blind, shakes a hand at the carnage, laying him bare to the crib, remembers neither the revolt of beginnings nor the submission at arrival. Between birth and death, there's nothing, not even sorrow. My father is a big baby, born today, gone tomorrow. The next poem, the same sequence, is called Threshold. The roses are on their own, 
the grass spreads like water from an upturned urn. Between mornings merged blue like bruises and evenings bubbling up like blood along broken arteries of the sky, the road narrowing through hedgerows, hens, fallow fields, darkening stream, slows towards home to halt at my father's feet far from town. He clasped his hands over his head the softening crown, and I see his hands are no longer hard or brown. Gastronomy. We ripen through the rain, carrion for crow. The night wedged between wings, beak, claw. What it spits out in red surfeit is what you saw with your eyes felt in your heart the white of snow leaves lit like candles long after the sun had set bow down to the bird his hunger is all god the ache at parting clawed from clawed is all man father or son bereft and the poem from the same sequence catafalque who shifts stars so June is here again? Who shifts the stars so June is here again? Moist light, virginal breath, and petal eyes wide open, she is tugging at the damp door. The bridge you walked on closes underwater, and the fish now swim over the road. The leaves lush with rain are lovely beyond reason. Burn at heart like fire. Redden the embers with your dying breath. Last the beauty of this sodden season. Uh, out of the 39 poems, this is the last poem. It comes in a whole sequence. And this is the last poem, which is a kind of redemption, because I really never had a good relationship with my father. Translation. Shadows drift under the street lamps, merge and pass, bear the empty earth between. If it were thus, pair of flesh and bone, what matters? Who hits the branch? Who at the center marching towards death? I sprung out of you. Now each difficult breath you draw weighs me down with what you gave. I am in debt to all I see and clear, sorry, here. Fields of corn flaming in the field of day, the stream plucking its way through stars, the moon caught in flight in a throng of thorns. Your gifts are at work even after death. Time effects its slow translation of the original into elements, the living texts various versions. I must bow down to the ground I tread, recall with grace what is lost as you pass into earth and air, holy as a host in bread. Uh, since I have read so many poems from my father, I'm going to read a poem my mother, which is an old one. Otherwise, it will be seen as an anti-feminist move. Signature. I don't know after him. Gestures I trace to my mother, her hands pick their aerial way through dire states of mind, the agonies of taking care of children who return prodigally from vocations. Her fingers are in curlers, they roll, preen, and part the air, knead a word into an abandon of tears. Forever in motion, her hands have no limits, nor remember the curtsy knock before a door is opened. Free hands flying farthest from gravity into high theater where all words bow down to the strung soliloquy of gestures and the oracular act of nerves. Hands that discern disasters balling up like storm clouds horizons away, whose certain coming she lets you know 
by conjuring rash trays of broken glass. Like the mute, my mother counts the sins and saints of the house on her fingertips. The air around her brews with signs of love. Thanks. Thank you, CP. Uh, <laughs> next up is Margaret Mascarenas. Good evening. Can you hear me? No? Okay. Better? All right. Uh, I'm going to be reading from a collection uh, that's recently out called Triage, Casualties of Love and Sex, where I essentially treat romantic love as a medical emergency, as a kind of sickness that needs to be cured. Um, I work in uh, interdisciplinary art, so this is also a collection that has sketches because I like to mix things up and see how text and image affect each other and also how uh, audio might affect the levels of meaning of a, of a poem. And uh, I think the last poem I'll do, I'm going to ask for your uh, participation and assistance because uh, I also like to uh, demonstrate the kind of visceral traffic that goes on between the poet and the audience. So I hope you'll help me out with that. The first poem I'm going to read is called Lost. Walking me to the car, he puts his tongue in my mouth, a swift and cunning transfer of bodily fluids before I can take stock, decide yes or no, remember he's not the man I love. That extra beer, his insistent tongue, those happy pills prescribed for fractured hearts, not a good amalgamation. There is no halfway house where I can rest, this is mythology. There is no neutral ground, no quarter given, nor quarter taken, and I have lost my way. Do you know where my love resides? Five ghosts on the crossroad point in all directions. I drive the labyrinth until finally the iron gate, inseparable barred passage. I don't know the magic words that will open it. You said, blessed are the weak in spirit, and in my mind I'm guessing, Desperate, abject, kaput. Despite my ruined state, it is repellent to speak these words, to be these things, to let them be the open sesame. And so, although I have arrived, I am still lost. New moon. New moon and my black night. Gunmetal against my thigh, clean coral at my core, don't touch it. No belly round for me, I will not be consumed by fat hauntings and murderous confessions. I will not be erased by your darkness. I will look only from the corner of my eye. And if I don't see you tomorrow, my love will last forever. When you wouldn't hear me. Finally, when you wouldn't hear me, I thought, I'm ready to perform the surgery now. Excise your smug inattentiveness, cut your rationalizations into ribbons, and plant upon your lips a souvenir kiss. I have learned where to leap when the carpet is pulled, how to balance on the edge of a cliff, how to ride the waves in a storm. Momentarily, I consider salvation, but there are too many animals missing from this ark. Identity crisis. Bitter hyena attacking eunuch. No one is innocent. Stop your barking. Do you see these eggs? So delicate, so vulnerable innocuous brown specks on Ekru. If I smash them against this tree, my nerves will finally be quiet. If I smash them against this tree, you will finally understand. You are not a hyena. You are an eagle. You have wings. You can fly. Uh, 
How much time do I have? A couple more? Okay. Love medicine for Louise Arabic. The fever has abated, the bloodletting has ceased, leeches. It is barbaric, this medicine. False nightingale singing out of tune. I should have known she was mad, that she would set my hair on fire. Voracious beak digging my cerebellum, levithian claws, tearing and infecting my skin. Into the river I toss the bandages, my wounds bleed inward. Let this hurt be a lesson to all. It is better to cover the mouth and be chased at all times than to be consumed by a plague of doves. And now, people, you're going to help me out. Please don't be shy. This is called Echo Gets a Second Chance. You know, in the Narcissus story, Echo just loses it. But in my story, she gets a second chance. Um, can I stand for this so I can? All right. I don't want to rip my mic off or anything. OK, on one side, we're going to do a little practice session. So on one side of the room, I want you to chant softly, not at the top of your lungs. Look, look, look, look. Come on, can you do it for me? Look, look, look. OK, when I signal you, I want you to do that, not before. And when I signal you to stop, go ahead. And on this side of the room, I want you to chant, behold. Behold, behold, behold, okay? It's easy, you can do it. Help me out. All right, here we go. Echo gets a second chance. White satin between my thighs, the stain of fresh berries on my lips, a real rose in my hair, not cold silver. Can you see? I am cleansed with water of lavender. I am polished with oil of jasmine. Look at my skin glowing like a beacon, an invitation to others, not you. Observe me strumming the hair strings of my guitar. Observe me singing myself back to life. Observe this jubilant revelry of the senses. What did you say? I cannot hear you yelling. I cannot hear your toxic disdain, and I cannot hear your chronic discontent. Look how I spit out the black crow. Look how I refuse the hot air. Look how I no longer receive your Trojan horses into my heart. Behold. Behold, Narcissus, my voice no longer condemned to repeat. Behold how I repay a favor with a fountain of silver culled from behind your mirror. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. And now, uh, Bejan Matur okay. from Turkey. Thank you. Uh, I write in Turkish, and just to give you an idea about the sound of Turkish, I want to read in original language the first poem, then I will read in English, which I'm not used to it normally. Törengi isileri. Çürümüş, donuk kalbinde bu toprakların gözleri gördüm. Herkes sesiyle vardı ve duruşuyla gövdesinin. Bir insanı en iyi sevişirken tanırız. Kalbimizi birlikte çürütürken. Ağırlaşan gövdemiz gece uyandırır. Mezar gibidir avlulu evler. Çocukluk bir uykudur, uzun sürer. Ve dokunmak için bir arzu, bir arzu sürükler bizi ölüme. Ben kendimi sınadığım her gövdede. Ben kendimi bıraktığım her şehirde, içime aldığım göğünü ülkelerin ve boşluğunu görünce kalbimin gitmeli dedim. Çürümüş tören giysileri içinde askıda salınan kökler. Biz denize düşürsek de ateşi o hep yanar. Issızlık bahşeder karanlığa yanar. Tarih bir yanılgı olabilir diyor şair. İnsan bir yanılgıdır diyor insan, Tanrı 
Çok sonra bu toprakların kalbi kadar çürümüş bir sonrada insan bir yanılgıdır diyor Tanrı ve düzeltmek için varım ama geciktim. Ölü kızıl suyun dalgası, gece yürünen yol ve yolcuların dağıldığı zavallı yeryüzü, salınan beyaz kefenler, tören giysileri ve bir koşu için gerekli tek şey atın yelesidir. Asıl olan şimdi ve burada çürüyüp kaldık. Tanrı görmesin harflerimi. İnsan bir hata diyor durmadan ve hatasını düzeltmek için acı veriyor, sadece acı. Ceremonial robes. In the cold decade hard of these lands, I saw eyes. Everyone was there with their voice and their bodies pose. We know someone best while making love, when we corrode our hearts together. Growing heavy, our body wakes us in the night. Houses with courtyards are like graves. Childhood is asleep, long lasting, and a yearning to touch, a yearning drags us towards death. I tasted myself in everybody, I abandoned myself in every city, I took the skies of the countries to my heart, and when I saw the emptiness of my heart, I said, it's time to go. Inside the moldering robes of ceremony, roots sway on the hunger. Even if we drop fire in the sea, it will burn forever. It burns a gift of desolation to the dark. Perhaps history is a mistake, says the poet. Mankind's a mistake, says God. Much later, in a future corrupt as the heart of these lands, mankind's a mistake, says God. I'm here to correct it, but too late. The wave of red, red lifeless water, the road followed that night. The poor earth strewn with travelers, the white swaying shrub, ceremonial robes. The only things needed for a race is the horse's mane. This is the truth. Now we are here, rotted away in a rut. God must not see the letters of my script. Mankind's a mistake, he keeps saying, and correct his mistake. He gives sorrow, only sorrow. Uh, now I'm reading a poem from, a, it's a long poem, it's, uh, it's called Seven Nights. I will read two part of it only. Every night is sacred, said one, every night sacred. There will be many more nights of longing, and we, what do we hear? In the courtyard where we sat yesterday, the rose that was black opened its souls today. A revelation, and the water's a revelation, the fragrant divine breath of birds flying past the rose and their voice is your breath still in the making. When you look at the rose, every scene here is cleansed. Your desire was weighed in heaven. When I speak of an angel, the city is utterly black. I spoke of an angel, and perhaps I said, the black nature of the city exalts the angel and opens its wings to words. Undoubtedly, we will talk of time, of the burden the child carried across the stream, of a sister, of a curse, of an absent mother, of a dad. We will talk of a mother who didn't give birth of denial. So much happened. Trembling replaced trouble. Enlightenment came, and you remember the mother and the dad. How many dead is night? this night and morning, impossible to count the deaths of the past. For every moment they are with us, their soul breathed within us, the waters gleam and darken with their eyes.
first to that a son belongs. Again, I felt the heaviness of light, wings of a soul unable to open. Had we, had we wished, we would have filled the earth long ago, but we couldn't. Something held us back more than fear, something close to compassion held us. Then dust flew in the air, waters passed through a bridge with a sacred name. Love grew in unknown veins, and they named him Abraham. He was father of children and father of all. Abraham weeping, weeping by a lakeside was not all unhappy. Carrying his sacrifice, he did not grieve. First to that a son belongs, that owns a son. We look forming, is it cross, crosses this courtyard and this color will come to see the world, the earth and beyond earth, the come and go of healings brings humanity to God before and after and perhaps always uncertainty. Remaining uncertainty is a decision. God gave the first sign by lulling man to sleep in the garden. The first sign was love, sleep and call it love, dream and keep dreaming, the same garden, the same mother and Abraham who will know his God. And the last small, very small poem, it's called Being. Time of roses and autumn, long ago dust mingled with bones and the universe ceased. Being, beginning in the home and never ending, new words were summon you, a pattern of dust to show things to come and you remaining afar. Thank you. Thank you, Veza. And now it's my turn. Um, I'm, I'm a bit of an imposter here. I write fiction. Uh, but I also translate poetry from Hindi to English, and I'll be reading from my translations of Sri Kanthwarma's Magad. Um, there's a lot that could be said about it, but suffice it to say that it's one of the greatest uh, volumes of poetry in the Hindi language, and by my lights in any language. I'll read a few po poems from it here, but uh, they are definitely meant to be read as a whole. So buy the book. Offering. I could have saved myself, but how could I? Those who save themselves cannot create. I simmered, then blazed. I began to crack. I could have cried out, but how could I? Those who cry cannot sustain. It was not self-sacrifice, not self-abuse, not resignation, not castigation. What was it then? I could have blamed someone, but how could I? Those who blame cannot create. Magad. Listen, horseman, where's Magad? I've come from Magad. I must go to Magad. Where do I turn? North or south? East or west? Here I see Magad. Here it disappears. Just yesterday I left Magad. Just yesterday, Magad's people told me not to leave Magad. I gave my word. I'd be back before sunrise. But there is neither Magad nor Magad. You too have been searching, brothers. Not for the Magad you've read about in books, but for the Magad that you 
like me, have lost. The road to Ujjaini. All travelers going to Ujjaini. This road does not go to Ujjaini. And the same road goes to Ujjaini. Till yesterday, I'd show the way saying, attention. This road goes to Ujjaini. I show the way today as well saying, attention. This road does not go to Ujjaini. Travelers. The truth is that every road goes to a journey and that no road goes to a journey. A journey forever looks to the road. A journey has turned away from roads. Then where should those going to a journey go? They should go to a journey and say, this is not a journey because we did not arrive here on the roads that go to a journey or on the roads that don't go to a journey. <clears throat> Nameless in Avanti. Will it make a difference if I say, I'm not from Magad, I'm from Avanti? Of course it will. You'll be taken to belong to Avanti. You'll have to forget Magad. And you will not be able to forget Magad. You live your life in Avanti without knowing Avanti. Then you'll say, I'm not from Avanti, I'm from Magad, and no one will believe you. You'll cry, it's true, I'm from Magad, I'm not from Avanti, and it will make no difference. No one will believe you are from Magad. No one will recognize you in Avanti. The Republic of Kosal. Kosal is a republic in my imagination. The people of Kosal are not happy because Kosal is a republic only in the imagination. The citizens gamble all day. Those who don't gamble sleep. The citizens tell stories all day. Those who don't tell stories sleep. The citizens are peevish all day. Those who are not peevish sleep. The citizens rejoice in Kosal's past. Those who don't rejoice sleep. Kosal is a republic in my imagination. And one last poem. A just war. How is it possible for the number of dead to be the same on both sides? How is it possible for the flag to fall on both sides, for the widows on one side to outnumber the unwidowed on the other? How is it possible for the sorrow in one capital to equal the mourning in the other? That there be repentance on both sides, that there be dharma on both sides, that there be shame on both sides, that both sides lay down their arms, that both be victorious. I say, it is not possible. One-sided the murderers, one-sided the victory, one-sided the arrogance, one-sided the fear, one-sided the widows, one-sided the unwidowed, one-sided the sorrow, one-sided the mourning, one-sided the joy, one-sided the repentance, one-sided the dharma, one-sided the shame the number of dead on both sides is not the same. So uh, that was the poetry readings. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions, I believe. Yeah, uh, so we'll take one from the front and one from the back. Uh, would you like to go first? Uh, hi, uh, that was lovely, all of you. Uh, I have a question for uh, Mr. Surendran uh, and, and also to Rahul. Um, uh, uh, to me, uh, the, the way which Rahul said that these poems are meant to be read at one go and they're meant to be part of the sequence 
and uh, as, as you yourself said about uh, your sequence, Catafall. Uh, it just seemed to me that a lot of these poems, which which are linked by the uh, which are linked by a cycle, and I'm thinking also of your earlier earlier poems in Canaries on the Moon, which you wrote about your hometown. Uh, is there is there a sense that these poems, which are linked, they are also linked in their sense of panic at time passing? Because because you uh, you used to said uh, in in one of your poems, uh, the world, the universe, which we escape when we blink, uh, the universe which we miss when we blink. So is, is there is there is this a sort of a recurring theme in poems which are linked in a cycle, in a sense that time is passing and that you will never be able to capture that precise shade of emotion. Uh, are you talking to me or Rahul? Um, I am always panicking. <laughs> that is the nature of the beast in me. I panic all the time. I panic even when I should not be panicking. I am panicking right now. Let me tell you that. Uh, yes. But, you know, uh, the idea of poem as a weapon to destroy panic doesn't exist anymore for me because I don't write poetry anymore. Uh, and I don't write poetry anymore because I don't think, uh, I, I'm a, I don't believe that the world is made up of the best minds. Ideally it should be, but it's not the case. So in my mind, I'm always talking to extremely mediocre people. Uh, which means that my emotions are of great value to them. And I know for a fact the reality, I don't know about the first world, but for certainly the South Asian sensibility, I think by and large, we are governed by a, a overarching sensibility of complete, unblemished mediocrity. So I don't think that my emotions are of any more value to anybody really. So I don't see it poem as a way of registering or recording shades of emotion. Um, uh, I would think that to a great extent language is, or I have failed language. I don't know how Rahul thinks because you know he very clearly is a very good translator. I'm sure he must have a few things to say about this himself. Was that my cue? Well, I, I wouldn't say, uh, I'm, I'm talking about Magad here, I wouldn't say the a uh, cycle of poems is possessed of a sense of panic at time passing, but there definitely is a sense of regret and bitterness uh, that things have come to such a pass. It's, it's uh, yeah, they're thematically linked and uh, they use uh, mythology and uh, history, names from them, uh, places from uh, history and mythology to talk about what I would call the ways of power, uh, the decline of great nations. And yeah, I mean, I, I don't think one could uh, say generally that all poem cycles are, are uh, possessed of this sense of panic at time passing, but yeah, it may hold true for some. Uh, one more question, anyone at the back there? Um, can you, okay. um, my, my question is mostly for Rukmini, ma'am. Um, uh, okay, I, I don't mean to, uh, this might be because uh, I, I'm not as familiar with poetry as a medium, or maybe it's because of the way you were reading, but um, I, I don't mean to sound offensive, but I, I got the feeling that um, uh, some of the poetry that you read uh, I, I, I felt like if, if you had told me that you were reading from from prose, I would have believed that. So like I I, I kind of got the feeling that it was um, like I, are you Say are you understanding um, what I'm? You can you can be offensive. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay, so I just I, I I got the feeling that it was poetry that I I mean I I would have classified as prose if I didn't actually see it on paper and I. I started reading your your novel, and the for in the first couple of pages, I've also kind of felt like that's I mean it's prose, but it like the words look it they give me the impression that I'm reading poetry. So I I I just wanted to know how you um, deal with like the like when something's coming out, how do you choose a medium? Because uh, at le with your writing, I kind of feel like it's not. It, it is kind of ambiguous, like the two, you know. 
Okay. Um, so let, uh, okay, uh, let me try to address this as clearly as possible. What you've said roughly is that when I was reading the poems, and they were short pieces, actually these poems have rhythm, rhyme, etc. but I read them quite flat. I didn't read them with expression, as it were, because I think that in some ways, you can leave it to the reader to judge the rhythms without necessarily stressing them or performing them. And you're right, there is a difference between the spoken medium and the written medium. And a lot of my writing is, you know, sort of embroidery on the page. So you have to see them in order to return to them. So maybe you're right that in a way it was flat. Uh, on the other hand, you're saying that my prose reads like poetry. And that, that is uh, to me a very necessary ambiguity because I write in different different media, and I think that in some ways, I, this classification into prose, into poetry, into rhythm, into rhyme, these can, be, um, these can be misleading, these labels. So I think that, you know, read it, and uh, all my work is for the page. I mean, very little is to, for recitation. Uh, others have said, oh, you know, it's lovely to hear you recite. So it's just, you know, what you hear and also not to be trapped in those, those labels because those labels uh, in a way, uh, uh, uh, in a way confine you and it's very important to realize that what you're, tr what you're trying to do is to uh, uh, uh, present and uh, present pure voice uh, combined with a root to understanding. So I understand poetry as voice plus understanding trapped into, trapped on the page. And I think you, you, you kind of realize that sense of entrapment. So thank you. And don't feel ever that you cannot question what you read because that is the best thing which could happen to writing, that people question it you know, and question its qualities. Thank you, uh, Rukmini. And we've run out of time here, but you can continue with your questions and discussions outside, I'm sure. Um, Rahul, there's one last question there in the corner. Hmm. Do we have time for a last one or? Uh, yeah, we'll probably have to take it outside. Uh, thank you guys very much, and thank you all the poets. Uh, a big hand for them once again. We wish to thank.